Uh, I had the pleasure to, to meet Dr. Gaunt in, in the spring at a conference in, in New York City where he gave a very interesting and detailed paper. This was before his, his book, which of course we are selling in the bookstore tonight, uh, came out. And it's, it's a book that's so filled with, with documentation and information on the Armenians and the Assyrians and, and what befell them in 1915. It's just, it's really groundbreaking material and, and everybody should be very excited about it. Uh, Dr. Gaunt has a very interesting history. He was born in London, grew up in New Jersey, and moved to Sweden in 1968. Uh, he received a PhD from Uppsala University and is currently professor of history at uh, Södertorn University in, in uh, Stockholm, where of course there is a large Assyrian community. I believe probably the largest Assyrian diasporan community. He uh, has published 10 books uh, and over 100 articles, mostly on Swedish social history, uh, but in the realm of genocide research, he's published Collaboration and Resistance During the Holocaust, Belarus, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and the new book, Massacres, Resistance, Protectors, Muslim-Christian Relations in Eastern Anatolia During World War I, published by uh, Gorgias Press. And I also want to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Kiras from, from Gorgias Press, the publisher, who is also here tonight. And uh, Professor Gant has published articles in uh, volumes published and forthcoming, uh, by, edited by Richard Hovanesian, including Armenian Tigranikert, Diyarbakir, and Odessa Urfa, which I believe we have in the bookstore. And uh, I just want to welcome him. It's very exciting to have him here presenting his uh, recent findings on this subject. So please welcome him and enjoy the, the evening. <laughs> Thank you very much for this invitation uh, from Nasser and from the United Assyrian Association of Massachusetts to speak with you tonight. Uh, sorry. Uh, speak as closely in as you can. I'll okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not a rock star, so I'm not used to <laughs> having three microphones in my face. I shall try. Um, and. Uh, and, 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 and please don't harass me if you think my English is a, a bit Swedishized. Um, <laughs> I can't help it. Um, I, I'm here to talk about um, a research that I, I knew was good in a, a research, uh, a book that I know is interesting, but now I realize is important and has a political importance that mm -hmm. perhaps it never occurred to me when I did the research that it had. This book, rather fat book, 500 pages, filled with details, lots of documents, all different kinds of languages, um, the aim of it was um, to uh, answer a comment that almost always came from uh, the Turkish government's side, that there were no documents that could uh, prove or even illustrate a genocide. Uh, and I had met this uh, argument many times, both in Sweden and in other places in Europe, and I'm sure you've heard it in America many times too. And um, my purpose in writing the book was to show that the evidence, especially on the local level, was overwhelming. Um, I, I started also, and this was because of my students, who, many of whom have a, a Syrian or an Assyrian background, who wanted me, they knew that I was researching the Holocaust, to also interest myself for 
the genocide that took place in the First World War in the Ottoman Empire. And I said, I didn't know very much, but could you come with some books and some documents? And they started coming with books and documents. And I said, well, I can't read all of these. Can you help me? Uh, because I know some European languages, but I don't know all the languages in the world, and there are a lot of languages. And they did help me. And they came with more books and more books. And in the end, I was actually uh, informing them about what the importance of the documents were, because they often didn't know themselves. And there came a time when I presented them, and there were representatives of the Turkish government, the Turkish embassy, uh, present in the auditorium. Um, and they did as they sometimes do, they heckle you uh, if you are saying things that uh, go against the uh, normal uh, Turkish historical line. Uh, the problem was that I was speaking at a conference organized by the Swedish government. Uh, and it's not a good idea to do things like this in a government organization, uh, or organized conference. Uh, and as a kind of compensation, it's a very long story, I was one of the few people in the world who have had access to Turkish archives in Ankara and in Istanbul. And I have, for that very reason, also filled the book as much as I could with the Turkish documents that I found. Uh, in this way, it cannot be said that I am using material that is uh, partial towards the Turkish side. Um, my, my way of, um, my method in research is not very complicated. Uh, we are trying to vacuum clean the world for documents in any possible, even theoretically vaguely uh, relevant language in order to put together a narrative about what has happened. This was necessary, especially in the Assyrian case when we began, because in no place was there a complete picture. There were only bits and pieces. But when you start putting bits and pieces from various countries together, it became a narrative that became um, uh, an integral entity, I would say. We look for documents that were written during the time or just after this was over. Uh, we have now Russian, Turkish, French, Italian, English, and German sources uh, very richly throughout the book, and even Iranian sources, which happily for me were in French, but uh, they, uh, also give a, a picture of what was going on. Uh, these kind of cross-referencing eliminates a lot of the problems that you have when you work with sources from only one country at a time. Uh, you can call it a slight, a kind of uh, triangulation in which one confirms the other and sometimes we have four or five version of the same event from different points of view and different countries and um, that has contributed to the thickness of the book not to the intellectual level of it but I, I thought it was very important that we also show that many people had observed the same events going on and have the same version. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you on the map pretty much where my uh, region of concentration is. Uh, I I'm going to have to go away from the microphone and I hope my voice can be heard all the way back. This is a rather obscure uh, region that I concentrate on, starting from uh, over here in Iran, Lake Urmiya, 
uh, stretching over to Lake Van and to Diyarbakir, down to Mardin and the, uh, the Syrian and Iraqi border. This is an area in, in which Assyrians and Armenians are intermingled, especially in the towns, but even in the countryside. Uh, as a rule of thumb, you could say that the uh, Gregorian Armenians are on the northern part of this rectangle, uh, while the Assyrians, uh, both of all uh, religious denominations, the Nestorians, the Chaldeans, the uh, Syrian Orthodox, the Syrian Catholics, uh, even Protestant uh, uh, converts, are to the south of this. There are also many Armenians to the south of this line that I just drew, but they are, as a rule, Catholic, and uh, sometimes did not speak Armenian, but uh, identified themselves more as Catholic than Armenian, but during the genocide were killed, not particularly because they were Catholic, but because they were Armenian. Uh, all of these groups are intermingled with each other. Uh, they sometimes fought with each other and sometimes died with each other. Uh, a, a lot of the sources that I will be, uh, that I use in the book, are from diplomats. Here is a picture of uh, the, uh, a very important individual standing here. Uh, this is the vice consul in Ermia Vedensky, uh, who wrote many, many reports of massacres against. Armenians and Assyrians during the early half of 1915. Those of you who know Assyrian history will recognize this fellow over here. Uh, this is the dragoman of the, the interpreter of the Russian embassy. Later he became General Agapetros, the leader of the um, uh, Assyrian Defense Forces in Urmia, 1917-18. But at that time he was employed by the Russian consulate. Um, one can think, uh, diplomatic reports, what can they involve? Uh, mostly when we think of the reports about massacres during the, the genocide, we have the reports of missionaries. And they are very full, uh, very sensitive, very engaged. But military consuls and civil consuls like Vedensky were also eyewitnesses to the events that they were writing about. They were also the first civilians who would come to a massacre in order to uh, document it. Um, and Vedensky, uh, he was the first person to report what I believe to be the first mass massacre of Armenian and Assyrian civil uh, population at the end of February 1915. It's a little bitty place. I had a pen once. Over here, um, called Haftavan. In between a town called Dilman and another town called Krosrova. 
uh, in which one assembled all of the males, both the Armenians and the Assyrians, up to the number of between 700 and 800, and killed them. And Videnski, he reported, seeing how some were hanged upside down from over a well, decapitated, and then uh, uh, let fall down in the well, the next was up again, others were decapitated after having put their heads through a ladder, some were killed by uh, having walls pushed down on top of them. Uh, almost every conceivable means of killing happened except uh, shooting because the army was running out of ammunition. It was after Videnski's first reports that the Allies began to realize that massacres were going on in a more or less systematic way and issued in May of 1950, about three months later, their declaration that they would hold the Ottoman government and its agents responsible for the ac actions that they called crimes against humanity and civilization. What's going on here in this area? It's not very well known. Usually it isn't uh, the first thing that comes to mind when you are writing about the Armenian genocide. We know that something happened in 1915 um, to turn the Ottoman government's um, uh, uh, interest towards both moving the Armenian and the Syrian population, but also exterminating them. Now, some have talked about a battle way up in the north called Sarikamish, which happened around New Year's Day. Uh, the only problem with the Sarikamish defeat, because the Turkish army did lose this battle, was that, oh, Enver, the Minister of War was protected and saved by Armenian soldiers. He wrote to the Armenian Patriarch thanking him for the services of the Armenian soldiers. So it's very difficult to connect any event around that battle with a direct um, turning against the Armenians. But something happens a few months later. Um, and it has to do with cooperation between Armenian and Assyrian volunteer forces and the Russian army in this obscure tract that leads the Turkish army to believe that an Armenian or a Christian revolt is happening. Uh, you may recognize this picture of uh, uh, General Antranik. Um, he moves his volunteer brigade to Iran sometime in the fall of 1914. Uh, what most people don't realize is that in his Armenian brigade were also Assyrians. And there were Assyrian, local Assyrians, organized in a local self-defense, helped by Russians who gave them army surplus rifles, rifles but not cannons, not machine guns or the like, but uh, they did get equipment. And the Turkish side did know about that. They knew about these uh, self-defense being built up because 
uh, around Christmas time, 1914, they managed to capture and kill one of the Russian vice councils. His name was Iyas, and he was in the town of Sauchbulak. And they came over a whole bundle of secret Russian documents having to do with how to arm these self-defense units, which he had on his person. Uh, I have seen these in the Ottoman archives because they were collected in a dossier because the Turks would like to annex this region. And so one of, uh, the, there was a long report made with these things as, um, as an appendix to it, showing the degree to which there was a cooperation here going on. But this was not just the only thing. Uh, Andronik manages, um, together with his volunteer brigades, to defeat a Turkish army. That is, uh, a crack unit that is rushed up from Constantinople. Uh, if you will allow me, uh, I'd like to, to read from the book. Um, the leader of this unit was a general called Halil Bey, later known as Halil Pasha of Kut, the, one, the famous general who defeated the British at Kut al Amara. Um, so, aware that their makeshift forces were inadequate, the Turks were rushing reinforcements to western Azerbaijan. Lieutenant Colonel Halil Bey was sent with some elite units to command the occupation of Urmia. Until early December 1914, Halil served as military governor of Istanbul. Enver and uh, Halil, I should add, is the uncle of Enver. Enver then ordered him to form the 5th Expeditionary Force in, with an order to invade the Caucasus once they had come to Azerbaijan and to reach as far as Dagestan, if he could. These troops amounted to 248 officers, 10,920 soldiers, six machine guns, 12 mountain howitzers. This is what is in the Turkish military archives. Uh, they also came to include local gendarmes, 12,000 irregular Kurdish volunteers. And Halil, he knew this part of the world because he had been sent on a as a secret agent there the year before, just to prepare uh, the possibility of an expedition. Now, Halil's original plan was to take the Russians by surprise. He thinking that they didn't know that he was coming. However, by the time he arrived, the events in Van were already taking place the siege of Van that began the 20th of April. And he's managing to get here in the middle of April. Um, and he has to send some of his force to Van to help out um, the beleaguered Turks. He was badly mauled then, his force, in a battle near Dilma. So we're back to the same place about where the massacre of Haftavan has just occurred. Now, the Turkish historical archive sources give the losses for the Turkish army for the first day of battle of 15 officers, 453 soldiers dead, 28 officers, and 1,200 soldiers wounded and 370 missing in action. This is a terrible uh, loss already on the first day. And we know that reports to the army, back to the 
field command and the high headquarters usually underestimate the number of casualties. Um, those who were in the area said that it was more in the neighborhood of 5,000 casualties. And the Armenian and Assyrian volunteers under Antronik played the decisive role in repulsing the Turks. The Turks managed to whip the Russian forces, but Antronik, and there is a book out there in the bookstore that describes just this little episode, managed through a superhuman motivation to stop the Turkish army. On the, um, now, Halil wrote his memoirs, and he never said a word about the defeat in Dilma, of course. Uh, he just said he had to disengage, unfortunately, from Iran and pull back because there was something going on in Van. He had to help out, uh, which was strange, uh, at any rate, I think. Uh, but he blamed his defeat on the Armenians, and uh, with that he must have meant also the Assyrians, if he knew that the Assyrians were participating uh, in these units. Um, now, he followed the example of Jevdit, the Valley of Van, and executed his Armenian officers and soldiers and medical personnel that he had with him in the expeditionary force. Uh, the exact date for this, we don't know. Uh, but it must have been within the week after this defeat at Dilma. Um, the German advisors to the Turkish army knew that Halil, while in Persia, had ordered the execution of several hundred unarmed Armenian soldiers and officers and all those who were in the labor squads, the ones who were carrying the ammunition and the transport and the supplies. One German officer, uh, a famous fellow in German history, Max von Scheubner Richter, uh, you may know him also as Hitler's closest advisor uh, in the early 20s, he stated in a letter that Halil Bey's campaign in northern Persia included the massacre of his Armenian and Assyrian battalions and the expulsion of the Armenian, Assyrian, and Persian population out of northern Persia, and consequently there was great bitterness towards the Turks. Now, how does Shoivna Richter know that? That is because he went, uh, accompanied Halil Bey's troops during an entire week, uh, about a month afterwards, and they talked of nothing else. Uh, one Turkish officer later wrote that upon the orders of General Halil, 800 Armenians, and at another time, 1,000 so 1, soldiers, officers, and medical doctors of the expeditionary force were disarmed and killed by the Turkish soldiers of that force. The Assyrian-American, uh, uh, Jacob Sargis, a doctor at the missionary hospital in Ermia, recorded a conversation that he had with the, um, the local Ottoman-appointed district governor of Gawar, who had just refused an order to execute Armenian soldiers. Uh, but despite his refusal, someone else stepped in and did it. Um, he said that in this little place, 29 soldiers were killed and eight Armenian officers just outside Ermia. Now, the loss of this Battle of Dilma is probably the decisive turning point in which uh, the army starts using its own soldiers against unarmed Armenian and Assyrian population. It's no longer simply the wild Kurdish tribes 
uh, who would be working in collusion sometimes. But here, the, this, uh, if you know Holocaust history, there is a point in the Second World War in which the um, the Reichswehr, the, the normal army, the regular army, learns that it also can kill Jews and gypsies, and does. Uh, it's not an easy thing to convince military people to turn their weapons on civilians. This is not their training. Um, but some units of the army were known as butcher battalions. Uh, we have the testimony of a, a Venezuelan mercenary in Ottoman service. His name was uh, Rafael de Nogales. Uh, you have his book also probably here. Now he observed afterwards uh, that Halil Bey did, and I quote, as he pleased in wrecking his own vengeance on the Christians for the moral and material aid they had lent to the Russians during the Battle of Dilman. And Halil, in his retreat, confronts first the Assyrian Nestorian tribes who force him to go over the high mountains to Beatlis and to Sayirt, and in each place that he comes, he kills Christians and uses his army to do this. They have an attitude problem at this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, that is very real. Now, um, so uh, it is a bit remarkable that uh, a successful defense by Armenians and Assyrians together, and probably more Armenians than Assyrians, but this is hard to say. Um, how do I know that there were Assyrians there? Because Armenian reporters who wrote for the Russian press wrote about the presence of Assyrians, or as you called them in Russia at that time, ISOR. Uh, uh, and this was fairly clear. Uh, also, it seemed that the government in Constantinople was seeing Assyrians and Armenians in the same light. Now, uh, you all know that in Van, the, be, there began a bombardment of the Armenian quarter on the 20th of April. Uh, after a period of extreme tension and a lot of provocation in places around. And uh, some places, uh, massacres had begun re already the 19th of April. On the 23rd of April, the authorities from Van also report that the Nestorian Assyrians had revolted and they requested military aid in order to uh, crush this revolt also. So uh, things seem to be happening at the same time. Uh, when Reshid Bey, the valley of Diyarbakir, a real butcher, um, almost pathological, later is defending himself at uh, a trial after the war, he says that well, when I came to the valley, the Armenians, the Nestorians, and the Yazidis, uh, a Kurdish non-Muslim group, were in revolt. And I had to do something about it. It was either them or us, sort of. Um, uh, when Talat Bey, uh, who is the Minister of the Interior, spoke of the ethnic cleansing of Hakri Mountains, where the Nestorian tribes have traditionally lived. He said at the end of June, when it seemed very clear that the Turkish army was pushing them out, that they 
are in cooperation with the Armenians and the Russians, and we should not allow them to return to their homes. Uh, this is a telegram that I actually found in the archives in Istanbul. Um, a great deal of military and civilian coordination went into pushing the Nestorian tribes out of Hakkari area. Uh, for the first, the entire district was transferred to the province of Mosul, so that the valley of Mosul, whose name was uh, Haider Bay, could actually command a military force into this. Uh, he could bring up fresh troops. At the same time, uh, different Kurdish tribes from three different directions were focused on this area. And um, while the Nestorians were very good shots, and they made their own guns and ammunition, they were no match for howitzers and machine guns and the like. So it took not very many months to push them out of the area. Uh, but it is clear that this was a decision that was discussed in the government itself. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, this um, is a typical uh, document from the Ottoman archives. This is sent from the Ministry of the Interior. If you cannot read it, it doesn't matter. It's very difficult to read. It's in a script called uh, Osmanli. Uh, even Turkish historians must go special courses in order to learn how to read this. And uh, some people try to avoid it. But this is the order of deportation of the Nestorian Assyrians. And the remarkable thing, uh, besides the fact that no one knows about this, uh, is that it comes before the war has actually started. For uh, the war actually is declared at the beginning of November uh, between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. And this comes on the 26th of October. Um, it, it's also one of the documents in the uh, appendix to the book. But uh, I'll, uh, now, and it comes from the Ministry of Interior, Talat. And he motivates it like this. The Nestorians, um, uh, this is the word that was always used at that time for Assyrians within the Turkish Empire. Um, the Nestorians have always remained suspect to the government due to their predisposition to be influenced by foreigners and become a channel and an instrument for them. And it's pretty sure he means by foreigners, the Russians, but it might also be, mean the, the English. Um, because of the operation and the efforts in Persia that we are planning, the concern of the government over the Nestorians has increased, particularly about those who are found along our border with Iran. Now, the government's lack of trust in them results in their chastisement. It's a mild uh, word. Their de deportation and expul expulsion from their locations to suitable provinces such as Ankara and Konya. Uh, if you know Turkish geography, that's way west of where they're living. They are to be transferred and dispersed so that they henceforth will not live together in a mass but will live exclusively among Muslim people, and in no location are they to exceed 20 dwellings. So, the government will not undertake to provide any type of support while they are on their way. Uh, they will be 
permitted to be trans uh, to stay um, and uh, preparations for this matter to, to, to uh, depart from Van should be done by the valley. Um, the remarkable thing is that the Assyrians themselves knew nothing about this order of deportation. Uh, the sister of Mar Shimon, the religious and secular leader of the Nestorian tribes, her name is Shurma, and she wrote um, what is a kind of a chronicle of the war years um, and she writes that in surprise that the Turkish authorities had begun to arrest Assyrian farmers and artisans in the borderlands. And she also reports the murder of, by the government of 50 men who had been brought from the border to Beshkala, the local uh, capital city. Even in the westernmost district, which is far from the border, Bevar, peasant dwellings were sacked and women had abducted. And obviously these actions were, must be seen in the light of the deportation order and people refusing to be removed from their homes, just like the Armenians would protest against being removed. Um, Uh, and this is the beginning of a whole series of massacres uh, and local mass executions that begin in the autumn of 1914 and go into and up to May 1915 when Marshimun and the Nestorian tribes, according to what is stated and legend, declare war on the Ottoman Empire. Now, some Turkish historians take this declaration of war, which I haven't found the text to, but many people refer to it who are reliable, uh, as uh, an excuse for saying, well, they declared war on us, they deserved everything they got. Now, uh, from an international law point of view, even at that time, before the FN, um, the United Nations had made its genocide declaration. Uh, it was a crime against humanity to kill unarmed civilians, women, children, and even soldiers who were unarmed. Uh, and the elimination of entire peoples were also crimes against international law, both for the Assyrians and for the Armenians. Uh, now, I won't talk much uh, more at all in, in order that we will have time for questions. Uh, this book, uh, it contains much more than just what happened in Hakkari and in Iran. It also deals with what happened in Mardin, Diyarbakir, Bhutan, uh, other areas, uh, also the successful defense of a town called Azak uh, on the border to, uh, uh, to Syria, uh, in which a small uh, Syrian Orthodox village, including also Armenians who had been rescued from the caravans, uh, managed to stave off uh, a Turkish army. Uh, and there are about 20 telegrams from the Ministry of War about this little village. And because the Turks could not conquer this village, they wanted even the Germans who were there in the area to be involved. And so this was even discussed in the German government, what to do with little Asak. Um, I, I, I'll end here by just saying that I, I hope that my contribution tonight has shown that the experience of the <coughs> Armenians and the Assyrians are interlocked and that uh, unfortunately even when they defend themselves brilliantly and valorously 
it has dire consequences for the rest of their people. So I thank you. The declaration of war. Mm -hmm. um, now, let's see. This is the 26th, the 26th of October, mm -hmm. and the declaration of war is, I, um, uh, I, I believe it's like this, that the Russians are provoked to declare war first. And that happens either the 1st or the 2nd of November. And then the Turks declare war on them afterward. It was important for Enver that it wasn't the Turks who were seen to have started the war. Um, so it's about a week. It's not 13 days. Because the Turks were using the old... Oh, yeah. Very often they were using the mm -hmm. old uh, Julian camp. The, 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 the uh, the way, yeah, yeah, they were using Rumi and uh, I know Hichiri from, and... Mm -hmm. I know from letters that I have seen from the beginning of the 20th century sent to the United States where they would have both dates. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, even the Russians had uh, their dating system. Oh yes, until um, the revolution. Yeah, mm -hmm. but... Um, and even later they were using well, the Well, the, the beauty with uh, working in the Turkish archives today is that they have a book. So uh, on the shelf, so you go and look it up. What is that date actually in modern terms? So that that's what we did when we but dated. What were this. these people using? See, they could be using the modern, or they could be using the new one. In they the could have been using Hitchery, or they could have been using Rumi. Um, I, I, since I, we have it in the book, I'll, I'll look and see. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, they're, they're using Rumi. Which is Rumi? I know okay. it as yeah. the uh -huh. Julian calendar versus the Gregorian. Right. The old style versus the new style. Thirteen days. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rum is a variant is it, of Hijri, but it it's based on... Now? Hmm? Is it what we are using now? Oh, no. It's the previous one. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and if you looked at it, you could be confused and think that it was September, actually, when it is October. Um, so, uh, but what you're pointing to is a, a big problem that all of us have all of the time with this um, problem of different dates. Uh, I, I put out the alternative dates whenever I can. Uh, but sometimes you can even fool yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, it, you, you think that it might be afterwards, after the war had begun. I'm not Could trying be. to say it is, yeah. but because yeah. at this time in uh, history, that's people are confusing or using all the yeah, but we have asked the, the Turkish authorities about the, or the, the this since it's in their archive, and they say it's October, and that, that's all I can say is I can't argue with them. Oh, I'm not arguing. I just want to. Yeah, David in the back. Speaking of rebellions, could you comment on? Could you speak up, Dave? Speaking of rebellions, can you comment on uh, Ottoman-inspired uh, rebellions behind the Russian lines? Uh, Ottoman inspired behind the Russian lines. Okay, I can only speak about what goes on in Iran because th that's my area of uh, uh, of research. And uh, yes, they try uh, to engage both uh, Turkmen, uh, Afshar, uh, Turkic-speaking peoples to 
join uh, also Kurds behind uh, the Russian lines. Um, uh, there, I have an entire section about how they build up uh, just south of Lake Urmia um, a, a volunteer group of Iranian Kurdish tribes uh, together with uh, uh, a sort of a, uh, well, uh, Turkish, we call them Teshkilati Masusa, the special organization operatives that were in the area. Uh, so we have a bit about that, yeah. Uh, but further up in the Caucasus, don't know. I, we can see that they write about, they want this to be done. And you know they've even approached the Armenians to see if they would be willing to uh, organize something behind the Russian lines, but they refuse. Uh, so this is something that they wish for. Just in front, you, you spoke about the uh, <clears throat> the period of the 1914-1915 actually in the uh, eastern of Europe, I mean of your Turkey, which is the uh, Iranian section, that area. And you gave us a, a reason for all the, how the whole process, how the whole war started, and one of the main reasons why the rebellion started. And I know you have not really done anything on the other section, which is the Arbakur and uh, Orfa and Kabul mm -hmm. and Al Aziz and all these areas where, if you had read the book of uh, Shall This Nation Die by Reverend uh, jo uh, Joseph uh, Naim. 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 Mm -hmm. and uh, you would see the, the real genocide there. Do you think, my question is, do you think the same reason these people had paid the price because of the rebellion in that area in the eastern of you, uh, 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 Turkey, or it, that was another reason for that? Okay. Now, uh, I have heard that just last year that there was a Turkish historian who actually did in a conference in Mardin say that, yeah, um, the, all the Syrians are alike, and even uh, the Syrian Orthodox people of uh, the Diyarbakir area, and uh, because Martian Mun had declared war, the, that was why things were happening there. Uh, my view is that each religious group was treated a little bit differently, uh, and in their areas, and also because of the individual um, administrative leaders in, in, in place. And Diyarbakir was especially um, unfortunate in having um, a psychopath to, for, as provincial governor by the name of Mehmet Reshid Bey Shaheen Giray. And he was a medical doctor, so he was influenced by uh, racist thinking that he, uh, as many doctors were at that time. Uh, when he was asked why he, as a doctor, uh, could uh, kill so many people, he said that the Armenians, and I think he meant many Christians uh, as well, because he didn't murder so many, um, were like bacteria, and wasn't this the, um, the task of a doctor to see that bacteria is removed from the body of the nation. Uh, and the remarkable thing was that he said that in an interrogation from the lead, a leading member of the Committee of Union and Progress who had called him to Istanbul because they thought his killing was too extreme for them. Uh, we also know that he started the killings in Diyarbakir before there was actually a deportation order for the Armenians issued for that province. I think many of you know that uh, the deportation orders for Armenians did not come as a universal, but uh, were piecemeal, province by province. So the one that came at the end of May uh, 
was for the provinces that were closest to the front line, Erzurum, um, Sivas, places like that. The Arbica was not on that list at all because it was far from the front. But Reshid had killing going on from April, at least. Uh, it began with Assyrian villages like Karabesh, just outside the Arbikir. Then uh, all of the Christian notables of the Arbikir were arrested, about uh, 1,200 in the first weeks of May. And these were then sent away on Kelix, these inflatable rafts along the Tigris River, and uh, were murdered uh, a bit further on down. We actually have found uh, the memoirs of uh, a Kurdish tribe who participated in the killing and how they had negotiated with the valley about how to divide up the loot. And I have a bit in there as well. So something was very strange was going on in the Arabic year. Um, yeah, how, how much awareness was there in Van, for example, of what had been going on just a month or two before to the east? Um, Van realized that something bad had happened when. Uh, Jebdid Bay, their valley, came back in March 1915. He had been the leader of one of the occupation armies in Iran. And he was the one who was actually the commander responsible for the massacre in Haftavan. And he had this famous battalion that he called the Butcher Battalion. And we have two people uh, who give witness to that he called a group of notables together and said that I have just made a clean sweep with the Armenians and Assyrians in Iran and I would like to do the same in Van. Now, the one is Johannes Lepsius and the other is a, a, a Chaldean priest by the name of uh, Said. Uh, so there was a realization. There were also letters being sent back and forth. George? You mentioned early in your talk that you were one of the few persons to have access to the archives. I was wondering how you accomplished this. And after writing your book, do you still have access uh, to the archives? And also, is there much sanitizing going on at the archives, especially with the European Union? Is there any encouragement to open up the archives? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, well, uh, I think the European Union negotiations were one of the reasons why I was given permission to uh, access to the archive. Because um, since the government was involved in this scandal uh, at the conference, um, pressure was put on them. Uh, you say that the archive is open, said one of the parliamentarians in the debate, show us that it is true. And after about a year, I did get first uh, a number of copies of archive materials that I had requested. And then a little bit later, when I had requested more, I got a letter from Ankara from the director of archives saying that I was very welcome. Uh, and then I got a lot of flack in Turkish newspapers, so I decided that I would go there. And I was very scared, uh, but happily, the people in the archives are uh, seemingly professional archivists and historians, and would uh, uh, even Tanner Aksham, when he was there during the summer, said that, uh, the director came with him into the reading room and said, this is my friend Tana, <coughs> help him with everything that he wants. So we have the feeling that the ice is broken here. The problem is that they can only deliver what is cataloged. 
Now, when I was there, there were the things that were catalogued were the letters and telegrams that were sent from the government in Istanbul to the provinces. What I didn't get was from the provinces back to Istanbul saying, well, we've completed your order, what do you want us to do more? Or uh, the various lists of the number of people sent away or the list of names and the seized property, because we can see that Talat is always asking, how many Armenians are, are left? How many of this and that and the other are left? Because he was interested in that only 5 to 10 percent of any religious uh, non-Muslim group was left in a certain place. And he sort of kept statistics on this, we know. Uh, because his family even has a notebook about that. Now, uh, now this archive opened, the one with the provincial replies, in the summer. And I haven't been there yet, but I have to go back. But, uh, but my friend Tanner, who was there, says that you can see that somewhere along the line, material has disappeared. Because uh, they were very bureaucratic, and uh, they numbered everything that came in in a certain order. And the archive has a different num number system that is very confusing, but when you sit down and look at it, some things that are numbered are not there. Uh, but the, even the stuff that is there is very, very damaging to anyone who wants to contend that there was no genocide. Um, have you had any reaction from the Turkish historians to your book? Uh, it, it's being translated into Turkish at the moment uh, by and Rashid Sarakulu's uh, press is going to publish it. Uh, I would imagine when uh, when they read it that it will be dismissed. Um, you know it's their own material? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, um, it, it's very, it would be very difficult for them to, uh, to move from their positions. And I do have such things that you can, I mean, you can turn them around. Now, I talk about the, uh, the, the, this battle at Dilma. Now, a Turkish historian who was is evil-minded can turn that around. Aha, see, there is an Armenian and an Assyrian revolt. Uh, see, they were a real danger to our, our nation. So uh, it, it may be that the debate will change. <laughs> but whether they will concede uh, their point, I don't know. Um, some Turkish journalists have already used the book uh, for, uh, recently there was a cave uh, found with a mass murder uh, where the villagers nearby said, yes, these were Armenians from 1915. Uh, and we found many other caves like that. Uh, and we managed uh, to locate or identify three or four different uh, possible uh, uh, deportation caravans or places where the, these people kind of come from. And in some cases, a few of the names of the, pe the, the people who could have been found there. Uh, but uh, just during the weekend, the Turkish military covered this uh, cave with earth. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if only we scientists can get access to that place, we're used to digging things up <laughs> again <laughs> anyway. So it may not be uh, 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 the smartest move that the military has done. But, but in that way, they have used the book already. Uh, but, but it's not really a comment or a review on it. No? Dr. Goff, this was a remarkable lecture, and I really thank you for, for presenting it to us. I wanted to just add three, three comments mm -hmm. that you may find useful. First of all, in Iran, there is a very limited but a process of publishing archives from 1915. 
these are done selectively right now, and I don't think they're terribly trustworthy, but at least they're in print and are mm -hmm. available and can be used, at least can be referenced. And, and I'll be happy to give you that, <coughs> that reference. The second is that this, um, you spoke about uh, Iyas, who, is, who was a, uh, at Sawish Bulag, which became Mahabad later. I've just published an article on, on the missionaries in Sawish Bulag so, uh, and their relationship with the Kurds. So that might be useful. But you, I just wanted to draw attention to those of you who, have, who want to visit London, or maybe we, we just missed it, but there was a major exhibit of Iyas's photographs sponsored by the Iran Heritage Foundation that took place in London. And there's a book with, with that, too, that I think could also shed some more light on, um, on this man's work. Uh, and he, uh, the finding of, of this material on his person after he was beheaded in, the, in 1914, um, in fact, included this, these massive photographs that he had taken as well. And the, uh, the last thing I wanted to talk uh, to mention is that in the case of the Assyrians uh, and the Armenians in, uh, in northwest Iran, we know that there were volunteers from far, as far away as Isfahan, the Armenian community in Isfahan, who came up to northwest Iran in order to participate in the resistance. Oh. Yes, you. Yeah. Um, Great speech, uh, by the way, lecture. Like, uh, just a quick uh, remark, or a question, actually. The Kurds in uh, Turkey and Iran and all those areas, what role, if any, did they play in all of these uh, massacres? And that, and also follow up, like, if Turkey ever does uh, admit to the genocide uh, to get into the European Union, will it bear any consequences on the role that the Kurds played uh, mm -hmm. with them? Just a... Uh, Okay, that's a good question. Um, uh, uh, as far as the Kurds are concerned, it's very, very uh, complicated. Um, now, in the area of Turabdin, in, in the Arbikir uh, Vilayet, uh, we have examples of Kurdish tribes who protect um, the, the Christians. Uh, the, uh, among others, uh, Chalebi Aga, Sarohan or Sarokano of the Habakan Confederation uh, do this sort of throughout. Then we have a number who begin to protect Christians mm -hmm. and who are convinced by the local government to turn. Uh, and so uh, oral testimony is filled with the deceit of the Kurdish tribes, but it's obvious that they had intended to protect them, uh, but that they had been forced later on. Um, we have the famous case of the Chaldean bishop of uh, Sayyid, uh, Elisher, uh, who is smuggled out of Sayyid during the massacres by Kurds, disguised as a Kurd, and is found by the Turkish troops two or three weeks later um, in a house of another Kurdish Aga and uh, both uh, Sher and the Kurdish Aga are executed. Um, th there is also a telegram from Talat saying that if there are Muslims who protect Christians, they can face prosecution and severe consequences. Um, however, there do seem to be a, a great number of Kurds who participate of their own free will. And it does seem that in many areas this jihad type of uh, uh, propaganda does go home, uh, especially in Iran, where we can see that it has been spread and even printed and put up on uh, everywhere. Um, and. Uh, we're talking of people with a very low rate of literacy and who are being told that this is a holy matter. Um, uh, now, 
how do we judge this? Now, in a way, it's sort of like the same problem I had with collaboration of Lithuanians and Latvians during the Holocaust with the, when they cooperated with the Nazis in killing Jews. Yes, they participated, but would they have done that if the Nazis had not said that they should do it? Probably not. And so they are collaborators, but they are not the instigators. They are the instrument. But uh, uh, in, in some way, the, there is, uh, there are circumstances, and perhaps someday we will be in a situation in which we we can speak with Kurds about what happened a little bit more freely. Uh, but that hasn't yet come. I don't think. Um, it's hard to say what the EU membership and uh, the problem of the Kurds would be since it's so complex even in connection with the Turkish state. Uh, so uh, uh, It would probably take me a long time to get a good answer to that question. <laughs> I'm sorry. George and the gentleman behind. Okay. Um, coming back to the same question that was asked about the Kurdish uh, mm -hmm. issue. The thing mm -hmm. is, you mentioned that in the, during World War I that the Kurds were more of collaborators than instigators. However, throughout their history, even from 1840s to 1846, we have many documents and many testimonies of them mm -hmm. massacring thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Christians, mm -hmm. mainly Assyrians, and of course there must have been some Armenians in there too, of being massacred, and the Turkish government had nothing to do with those massacres at the time, as far as we know. And uh, mm -hmm. so, to say that they were only collaborators, I would not, I would kind of question that, because we have some documents from their history of doing certain events again to the local Christians. So, was it more of a collaboration, or a um, wishful collaboration than anything else? Opportunity to do this. Um, this is true, but this would also take a very long uh, answer. I, I would say probably that we must begin by a, with a realization that the Kurdish society was more complex than simply uh, tribes, um, and that some were settled uh, in, in certain areas. In the Turabdina area, uh, there were many from a tribe called the Muhalemi, who remembered that there were Christians at one time and had converted, uh, who were a bit split. Some of them participated, and some of them were very instrumental, uh, especially in informing the Christians about what was being planned at the mosque or uh, at City Hall, and that, that sort of thing. Uh, I think there are uh, possibilities for helping were small. Uh, I, I don't think that it was actually possible for armed Kurdish tribes to sort of turn on uh, the Turkish army. Um, it, but in one case, we do have the Yazidis of the Sinjar Mountains, which I, I write about in the book, who uh, are Kurds, although they are not Muslims, and they uh, have an entire colony of uh, escaped Armenian and Assyrians living there, uh, houses, hospitals, uh, and other things for a very long period of time until they are also ethnically cleansed by, uh, by the army uh, several years later. And um, uh, so uh, perhaps we, I mean, we're in a situation sort of like the Second World War. Are all Germans bad? Uh, are all Kurds bad? It's, uh, uh, I, as a historian, sort of say, okay, I won't say that an entire people are bad. Mm. But, yeah. Okay, thank you, George. Doctor, I, uh, I have read that uh, in regards to the Kurds that, uh, that we just mentioned, uh, the Kurds uh, were promised if they, the Turkish government had told the Kurds if they worked with them in massacring the Armenians, that they were given them an autonomous state after the war. 
So because of that reason, uh, mm -hmm. the Kurds joined in with the Turks in massacring the Armenians at that time. And, but after the war, when they wanted that autonomous state, they, uh, they Turks entered back by massacring anywhere from 800,000 to 1 million Kurds between 1926 and 1931-32. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you had read that, uh, what happened, what the uh, Turks did to the Kurds. They got their just treatment for what they did to the Armenians and the Assyrian people. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, uh, this is sort of hard to comment on because I don't know all of the details, but uh, we can say uh, about all of the minorities, uh, both the Turkish side and the Russian side were promising them gold and uh, paradise if they would join them. Uh, their own nation, uh, even the Ottoman side had said something to um, Armenian leaders that they could have an autonomous uh, sort of autonomy if they really were motivated and uh, worked together with the, the Ottoman side. And the Russians did the same. And they said the same to the Assyrians. And maybe they said the same to the Kurds. Uh, the Russians were always working on trying to get the Armenians, the Assyrians, and the Kurds to work together. And there were some conferences, both before the war and during the war, to do that. But it just never really got off the ground. Um, so I don't know uh, if they were really promised by the Ottoman state their own state. Uh, uh, but they really did want one, that's for sure. Uh, and you're talking about the killings after the um, Sheikh Saeed revolt uh, in, in the middle of the 20s. Uh, there were quite a few Kurds who were killed at that time. Uh, that is true. Uh, and, and then they were fighting for their own independent state. That's true. But that's all I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.